Scripture reading before the lesson today will come from Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. I'll be reading from the King James Version. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, it seems only fair to me that since I prepared a Bible class lesson and two sermons, I might as well, since I've been given the opportunity, just stay up here for a while. Don't you think? Uh, We probably better not. Just in case it goes to the midnight hour and it starts freezing again and everybody wants to drive home, so... We'll just stick with one. Is is that okay? All right. We've been talking on Sunday mornings, even though it's actually afternoon now. We've been talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Have you learned anything about the fruit of the Spirit? Hopefully so. We're going to try and wrap that up today. And again, if nothing else, we're trying to understand those nine words, nine main words as they're used in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, Meekness, temperance, against such, there is no law. Just some quick, pertinent, I guess, observations. Number one, the Holy Spirit brings forth fruit in the life of every faithful Christian. That, that's obvious. That's what the text says, doesn't it? But in the second place, he does not do this directly. The Holy Spirit works this fruit in our life through a medium. And then in the third place, The medium through which the Spirit brings forth this fruit in our lives is the Word of God. Where there is no gospel, there is no fruit. Where there is no gospel preaching, you have no Christian. So the Spirit works through the Word. Now, just think about that. That does put the responsibility back on us, does it not? Because we have to study to show ourselves approved unto God. So that's what we've been talking about, and we're going to finish it up today talking about the last three aspects of the singular fruit of the Spirit. We're going to talk about faith, we're going to talk about meekness, and we're going to talk about temperance. That's what we intend to do today, and we're going to do it very similar, as in the same manner, that is, that we've done the other ones. We're going to define it, we're going to illustrate it, and we're going to apply it, and then it's going to be pretty much a day. So that's what we're going to do. Let's talk about the seventh aspect of the fruit of the Spirit, and that is faith. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. This is the first point, but it's actually the seventh aspect of the fruit singular of the Spirit. And if you observe Galatians 5, 22 and 23, it begins with the word but. That's in contrast to the 17 specific works of the flesh, meaning you can have or be guilty, rather, of any one of those 17 specific works works of the flesh, but if you have the fruit of the Spirit, you have all nine, and we have them to some degree, and then as we mature and grow in the faith, we mature and grow in those aspects, do we not? Indeed we do. So the seventh aspect, first point of the sermon is faith. Let's define it. Faith is confidence, trust, and conviction, but it is always accompanied by the evidence. Scriptural faith obviously comes from the Scriptures. Doesn't that make sense? But when you look at the New King James Version and the American Standard Version of 1901, both of them translate this word as faithfulness. Not just faith, but faithfulness. And perhaps that is a more accurate rendering, not necessarily of the word, but how it is used in the context of Galatians 5.22. When you look throughout the New Testament, the Greek word that the King James translates as faith, it is also translated as assurance in Acts 17.31. Believe it or not, the word is also translated as belief in 2 Thessalonians 2.13. And probably one of the best ways it's translated in this sense that it's being used is fidelity in Titus 2 and verse 10. So 
A sense of fidelity or faithfulness or trustworthiness, perhaps, seems to be the meaning behind that of Galatians 5.22. There it's simply defined. Now let's illustrate it. Unfortunately, perhaps even some in here think that faith or faithfulness is a direct result of a direct operation of the Spirit. Well, what? You, you hear that? That's kind of religious terminology, direct operation of the Spirit. What does that mean? Let me tell you what it means. It means wherever you are, you get zapped by the Holy Ghost. Maybe you're driving down the road. Maybe you're working in the garden. There's no telling. But somehow the Holy Spirit comes and zaps you and provides you with faith that you could never have on your own. And maybe even, of course that's wrong, but perhaps the wrong idea comes from Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Where the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Almost every person in the denominational world is going to tell you that the gift of God in Ephesians 2, 8 is faith. Well, that's wrong. The gift of God, there is grace. It's that which we cannot provide for ourselves. And really, when you look at that, it's salvation as a whole. Because we could never work our way to salvation. God has to provide it. And he has done that by means of his grace in revealing unto us the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, with all that being said, surely almost everyone in here, if not everybody, knows where faith comes from. And that's in Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So it is the gospel. It is the Bible. The New Covenant, even the Old Testament to a certain degree, which produces confidence, trust, and conviction in our lives. Now, I want you to turn with me to the book of John. And let's, let's look at this in action here. Look with me in John chapter 12. And there are some who say that God has to provide you with faith. Well, if that would be the case, wouldn't he provide you with everything else? If he was just going to zap you and, and provide you with faith? Wouldn't he also provide you with the ability to confess Jesus Christ as Lord? Wouldn't you think? So we see that we do have a part to play in this. God has his part, but he's done his part. So it boils back down to us and our part. Look at what the Bible says in John chapter 12 and beginning in verse 42. The Bible says, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also, many, that's more than a few, isn't it? Many believed on him. That is, they were convicted by Jesus of Nazareth. They saw what he did. They heard what he taught. Many believed on him, but... Now, before we go any farther, if I were to ask you, is Romans 10, 9, and 10 part of the gospel plan of salvation? I think you would say yes. So faith is one part, but then confession of Christ is something else, isn't it? Now, look at this. But because of the Pharisees... They did not confess him. Now think, if faith is something the Holy Spirit has to zap you in order for you to have, if he zapped you with faith, wouldn't he zap you with the ability to confess Christ? <laughs> wouldn't you think? So that shows we do have a part to play. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him. Why? Confess him. Why? Lest they should be put out of the synagogue for. Here's the reason. They love the praise of men more than than the praise of God. Now we've defined it, we've illustrated it, hopefully we understand it a little bit, now let's apply it. One of the greatest and yet most challenging questions anyone could be asked has its origins in 1 Thessalonians 2.4. I remember, I'll probably never forget it. I don't know if my mind will stick around as long as I'm in this body or not, but old Melvin Hampton, he used to stand us up and ask us this. Brock, can you be trusted with the gospel? And he, the roots of that question are found in 1 Thessalonians 2.4. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust, same word generally when you begin to look at it, with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. Can you be trusted with the Lord's gospel? Are you faithful enough and trustworthy enough for God to trust you with his gospel, and even individually, but also collectively. Can we, the Lexington Church of Christ, be trusted with the Lord's gospel? Are we going to use and handle the word of God deceitfully? 
Look that up, 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 3. We can, and the Word of God can be used deceitfully to twist the Scriptures to our own, what we think is to our own advantage, which is really to our disadvantage. So do we have faith? Will we be counted faithful? Will God count us as loyal and trustworthy? Because God himself is loyal and trustworthy, is he not? So is it wrong for God to expect his children to be loyal and trustworthy with his word? Absolutely not. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, as in faithfulness. Are we being faithful with what God has given us? Let's move on. The eighth aspect, second point of this sermon, is that of meekness. And I believe in the New King James, it expresses it by the word gentleness. Now let's define meekness. Most of us probably have some idea behind the word meekness, but meekness, when you define it, means gentle power or strength under control. The Greek word for meekness brings two main ideas. The first one is this. The first is the ability to endure injury with patience and without resentment. Now, that's a good definition. That's a good illustration, if you want to look at it that way, of meekness. The ability to withstand or endure injury with patience and without resentment. But here's the second aspect, and this is the one most of us have probably heard. The Greek word for meekness brings the idea of a wild horse being brought into the submissive state that we would know as being tamed. Now think about that. Think about that. The word meekness does not mean weakness. Meekness does not mean weakness. Think about that idea behind a tamed horse. I'm, I'm not a horse man. Some of you are or were. I would say just your average horse weighs 1,000 pounds, maybe even more than that, some a little less, but an adult horse, that's probably a fairly accurate guess, is around 1,000 pounds. Now, is that horse any weaker once it's tamed? Did that 1,000-pound animal all of a sudden, once it's tamed, become just a weak little nothing? Absolutely not. The same strength that was always there is still there, but what's the difference? That strength is focused. It is under control. So meekness is not weakness. It does not imply that someone is wimpy. It does not imply that someone is whiny. Though that may be what we think about meekness, but that's not what the word means. It does not mean shy. It does not mean reserved. And it certainly, absolutely, does not mean a defeated, spirited person. Sometimes we think a meek person has to just walk around and look down at the ground and barely even move. And can't, that's, that is not, absolutely, that is not what meekness means. Strength under control. Now, let's illustrate it. What if I were to tell you that the Bible says that Jesus was a meek person? Would you believe that? Would you believe that? Would you, do you understand the same word meekness? Meekness and gentleness of Christ is used by the inspired Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 10.1. That settles it, doesn't it? And then when you consider, did you pay attention to the scripture reading? If that wasn't enough, what did Jesus say about his own self? He said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Why? For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. So the Bible uses the word meekness in 2 Corinthians 10, 1 regarding Jesus and then Jesus himself. And then Matthew records it by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, what Jesus said of himself in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Now, do you think Jesus had no power? You think Jesus was a wimp? You think Jesus was a pushover? You think Jesus walked around with his head hanging down? Do you think Jesus was whipped in his spirit? Or do you reckon when he preached, he looked people dead in the eyes and said exactly what he needed to say? What do you reckon he was? Now listen, if you have any sense of confidence about you at all, somebody's going to say you're not meek. That obviously, no disrespect, but it shows their ignorance. It shows that they have no concept of what the word meekness actually means. Turn with me in your Bibles, if you would, please, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. If meekness means weakness, then how do you explain this? 
Because both meekness and meek is applied to Jesus. If meekness means weakness, explain 2 Thessalonians 1, beginning in verse 7. We think Jesus is powerless? Well, absolutely he is not. But he has that power and strength under control. He is also submissive to the will of the Father. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning in verse 7, picking it up in the middle of a thought, but I believe we'll understand it. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When who? The Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. So there is a sense of comfort that Jesus can supply. Correct? Matthew 11, 28 through 30. But now read on. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at the result in verse 9. Who shall be punished? Now that doesn't sound like a meek man, does it? There's no way Jesus can be meek and this scripture be true, right? Well, Jesus is meek and this scripture is true. So meekness is not weakness or cowardice. Who shall be punished? Those that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ with everlasting destruction. It'll never stop. From the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, verse 10, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day singular, the last day. To anyone who thinks meekness is weakness, very politely, you are wrong. You are wrong. Now, we've defined it, we've illustrated it, now let's apply it. Meekness is the exact opposite of stubbornness and hard-headedness. Y'all ever met anybody that was stubborn and hard-headed? I know you haven't. Surely none of us ever really have, but let's just say hypothetically we did once upon a time in a land far away meet someone who was stubborn and hard-headed. Do you know that the gospel reveals oftentimes who is truly stubborn and hard-headed? Because a stubborn and hard-headed person is the exact opposite of a meek man. Now think of what James says. That we're to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. A stubborn and hard-headed man will never see his true or her true spiritual condition. So we have to remain soft and submissive to the truth. Think about this. We almost get a little confused sometimes as to what the gospel really is. Most people, if you ask them, what's the gospel? They'll say, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Well, that's part of the gospel, but that's not the whole gospel. The gospel is the New Testament, the new covenant from Matthew to Revelation. Now, some of us have obviously had no problem hearing the truth, believing the truth, repenting of sin, confessing Jesus Christ as Lord, being immersed in water for the remission of sins, but then there's some other things that come up. Like what, preacher? Like beverage alcohol. What do you mean by beverage alcohol? I mean, there ain't nothing wrong with you, medicinally speaking. It's Sunday afternoon, the Panthers are playing. It's time to crack a beer, man. Watch a ball game, right? Now, what does, does the gospel speak about those things? Now, will we receive with meekness the, the gospel teaching about beverage alcohol, social drinking, whatever you want to call it? What does Ephesians 5, 18 say? What does it say? And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So there is obviously in that one verse a contrast. contrast. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Now question, can you be drunk with wine and filled with the Holy Spirit at the same time? You may be filled with spirits, as in alcohol, but you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, are you? Are you? Has the Bible, has the gospel laid out the truth about beverage alcohol? Now, are we going to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls? Are we going to take this teaching? We've heard baptism all our lives for the remission of sins. Don't have any problem with that, but now what about social drinking? Turn me to the book of 1 Thessalonians, and let's see what the Bible says in chapter 5. Ephesians 5.18 settles it. Whatever the word drunk means, we cannot be that because it means to be softened, to be intoxicated. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 6, look at this. 
Therefore, let us not sleep. Look at the contrast here. Let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and totally abstain from intoxicants. Look it up. The King James language expresses that word as sober. Question, can you be drunk and sober simultaneously? Literally drunk and literally sober simultaneously. I'm not talking about being drunk with power. I'm talking about being intoxicated by intoxicants. Can you? If you can, then you can be drunk with wine and filled with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit at the same time. Now think, verse 7, For they that sleep, that look at the sleep and the wake and the day and the night contrast. For they that sleep, when do they sleep? Sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, verse 8, us, who the church? This is an admonition to every member of the church to be sober, to totally abstain from intoxicants especially if there is no medicinal purpose behind it. But let us who are of the day be sober, totally abstaining from intoxicants. Why? So that we can watch. Putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. Brethren, I'm going to ask you, are you filled with the Spirit or are you filled with the spirits? There's a difference. Are we filled with the influence of the Holy Spirit? Are we filled or are we filled with with alcoholic spirits, which are you? Moving on. The ninth aspect, third point of this sermon, of the fruit of the Spirit, is that of temperance. Let's define it, let's illustrate it, and then let's apply it. The word temperance, when you begin to look at it, means dominion within. It means inner mastery. And I believe the New King James has it expressed as self-control. That is an accurate meaning of the word. What is temperance? It's inner control. It's self-control. Temperance has to do with the restraint of self in various circumstances. Think about this. Now watch. Everyone in here right now over the age of about five or so has temperance to some degree. If not, why are you not up running around here right now? If you can't control yourself, why are you sitting still looking at me right now? Right? When people say, I can't control myself. I can tell everybody in here, my children too. And there's one there out cold. Self-control. Temperance. Do you, do you understand? So every one of us, to some degree, we all have self-control, don't we? But now when things don't go our way, that's when it generally begins to come out, doesn't it? Temperance involves the control of the mind. When a person is self-controlled, do you know what that means? Ultimately, that means their mind is under control. Because, look, is my, is my left hand going to reach up here and start strangling me? Am I just going to go over here and start beating holes in? Is my, is my body run the show or does my mind run the show? My mind runs the show and my mind controls my body, right? How, how, is that how you work? Is that how you function? So temperance, self-control has to do with controlling what? It has to do with controlling the mind. Now, there it's defined. Now let's illustrate it. You remember old Flip Wilson? You remember what he'd say? Devil made me do it. We wonder what scripture he used. I understand he was a comedian and things of that nature. But wonder what Bible principle he got that from. Is that a Bible principle? The devil made me do it? Now listen, friend. The devil has never made you do anything. The devil influences us through the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, 1 John 2, 16. But he does not come hold, take hold of your mind, and make you say what you said. He does not take hold of you and make you do what you did. That's a cop-out. That's a cop-out. That does not happen. Now, in like manner, when we talk about the fruit of the Spirit, and one part, one aspect of the fruit of the Spirit is temperance, listen to me. The Holy Spirit is not going to come take hold of you and make you keep your mouth closed. He is not going to come take hold of you and make you walk through these doors when they're open. Do you understand that? That defeats the meaning of the word. The word temperance means basically self-control. Now, is part of the fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit making you control yourself? Well, that, that doesn't even make sense, does it? Not even a little bit. Think about what the Bible says in James 4, 7. 
Does this mean, that, can you do this? Or does the Holy Spirit make you do this? Where it says, submit yourselves therefore to God. What does that mean? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. What about James 4.10? Humble yourselves in the sight of God. And he shall lift you up. Now wait a minute. How, how can that happen? How can I submit myself? How can I humble myself when the devil made me do it? Well, the answer is obvious. The devil didn't make you do it. And the Holy Spirit is not going to make you do it. The devil influences by means of words. The Holy Spirit is influencing you now by means of words. Now, let's apply this word. Let's apply temperance. Are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Are you sick and tired of making the same mistakes over and over and over and over again? When are we going to take some responsibility for ourselves? When are we going to stop pointing every finger that we have, thumbs to, pointing everything this way when it's all right here? It's all right here in our mind. The person who has control of your mind has your soul. And do you know who has control of your mind? Whoever you hand it to. Ultimately, it's either God or it's the devil. Are you sick and tired? Have you read Galatians 5, 19 through 21? Are you sick and tired of falling into that same rut of the works of the flesh? And it's not exhaustive because it says, and such like. Are you tired of that? then what needs to happen? We need to make up our own minds that I'm tired of being tired. I'm sick of being sick. And I'm going to see what this book says and do what it teaches. Turn me to Hebrews 5. Watch this. You think Jesus didn't learn anything? You think Jesus just had an easy time? You think all this just came so-called naturally? He struggled just like we struggle. And he learned how to do these things. Look at what the Bible says in Hebrews 5 beginning in verse 8. Though he, that's Jesus, were a son. What does the Bible say? Yet learned. What did he learn? Yet learned he obedience. Learned he obedience by what? By the things which he suffered. And being made perfect. He became the author of eternal salvation to whom? To all them that obey him. You know, one of my favorite passages of scripture is found in Romans 6, beginning in verse 16. It begins in the form of a question. Know ye not. But Paul's not asking a question to gain information. He's giving information. He says, know ye not that to whom, now listen, ye yield yourselves. Servants to obey his servants, ye are to whom you obey whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. But ye have obeyed from the heart that form, that pattern of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then, then when? When you obeyed from the heart that pattern of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. What did James say in James 4, 7? Submit yourselves. What James say in James 4.10? Humble yourselves. What Paul say in Romans 6.16? To whom ye yield yourselves. We're going to choose to serve somebody. Don't you want to be filled with the Spirit? How am I filled with the Spirit? Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Think about it. Friend, it's not too late. Sometimes we may think it's too late. There's no hope for me. I, I've, I've done so many things that there's no hope. There's always hope. You're here. You're listening. You're paying attention. You're following along in the scriptures. There's hope. Don't you want to see eternal life? Don't you want to see the Lord on good terms? Don't you? Well, you got to start somewhere, so where do I start? I've messed up so terribly. Now, where do I start? Romans 10, 17, hear the truth. 
Acts 16, 31, once you hear it, believe it. You can do it. You can go to heaven. Do you believe that? Once you hear it, once you believe it, Acts 17, 30, change your mind regarding sinful conduct, whatever it is. When you make up your mind that you're sick and tired, you won't, none of us will be in that same rat race. We repent, we change our minds, and when we change our minds, our actions can't help but follow. Will you confess Jesus Christ to be the Son of God, Acts 8, 37? If you come forward right now, I'm going to ask you in question form. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? I don't know how much simpler to say it because it's either yes or no. Either he is and you believe it or he isn't and you don't believe it. We submit to being immersed in water so that the blood of Christ can wash away your sins, Acts 2.38. Will you? Well, here's the question for most everybody in here. Are we going to walk in the light? Are we going to walk faithfully in the light unto death? Revelation 2.10, 1 John 1, 7 through 9. Roads are slick, brethren, and they'll be slick again before you know it. People slide off the road constantly. Who's to say you won't be one of them? Who's to say I won't be one of them? Best advice I know to give you, make it right here and now. And don't worry about what's on the highway because you know who holds you so. You've got to come forward. Now's the time as together we stand and as we sing the song of encouragement.